Chapter Seventeen, Part Two of *The Voyage Out* by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mrs. Flushing could not resist such an opportunity. She gulped down the ode to Aphrodite during the litany, keeping herself with difficulty from asking when Sappho lived and what else she wrote worth reading, and contriving to come in punctually at the end with the forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting amen meanwhile hirst took out an envelope and began scribbling on the back of it when mr bax mounted the pulpit he shut up sappho with his envelope between the pages settled his spectacles and fixed his gaze intently upon the clergyman Standing in the pulpit he looked very large and fat. The light coming through the greenish unstained window-glass made his face appear smooth and white, like a very large egg. He looked round at all the faces looking mildly up at him, although some of them were the faces of men and women old enough to be his grandparents, and gave out his text with weighty significance. The argument of the sermon was that visitors to this beautiful land, although they were on a holiday, owed a duty to the natives. It did not, in truth, differ very much from a leading article upon topics of general interest in the weekly newspapers. It rambled with a kind of amiable verbosity from one heading to another suggesting that all human beings are very much the same under their skins illustrating this by some resemblance of the games which little spanish boys play to the games little boys in london streets play observing that very small things do influence people particularly natives in fact a very dear friend of mr bax had told him that the success of our rule in india that vast country largely depended upon the strict code of politeness which the english adopted towards the natives which led to the remark that small things were not necessarily small and that somehow to the virtue of sympathy which was a virtue never more needed than to-day when we lived in a time of experiment and upheaval witness the aeroplane and wireless telegraph and there were other problems which hardly presented themselves to our fathers but which no man who called himself a man could leave unsettled here mr bax became more definitely clerical if it were possible he seemed to speak with a certain innocent craftiness as he pointed out that all this laid a special duty upon earnest christians what men were inclined to say now was oh that fellow he's a parson what we want them to say is he's a good fellow in other words he is my brother he exhorted them to keep in touch with men of the modern type they must sympathize with their multifarious interests in order to keep before their eyes that whatever discoveries were made there was one discovery which could not be superseded which was indeed as much of a necessity to the most successful and most brilliant of them all as it had been to their fathers the humblest could help the least important things had an influence here his manner became definitely priestly and his remarks seemed to be directed to women for indeed mr back's congregations were mainly composed of women and he was used to assigning them their duties in his innocent clerical campaigns leaving more definite instruction he passed on and his theme broadened into a peroration for which he drew a long breath and stood very upright as a drop of water detached alone 
separate from others, falling from the cloud and entering the great ocean, alters, so scientists tell us, not only the immediate spot in the ocean where it falls, but all the myriad drops which together compose the great universe of waters, and by this means alters the configuration of the globe and the lives of millions of sea creatures, and finally the lives of the men and women who seek their living upon the shores. As all this is within the compass of a single drop of water, such as any rain shower sends in millions to lose themselves in the earth, to lose themselves, we say, but we know very well that the fruits of the earth could not flourish without them. So is a marvel comparable to this within the reach of each one of us, who dropping a little word or a little deed into the great universe alters it. Yea, it is a solemn thought, alters it, for good or for evil, not for one instant, or in one vicinity but throughout the entire race and for all eternity. Whipping round as though to avoid applause, he continued with the same breath, but in a different tone of voice. And now to God the Father. He gave his blessing, and then, while the solemn chords again issued from the harmonium behind the curtain, the different people began scraping and fumbling and moving very awkwardly and consciously towards the door. Halfway upstairs, at a point where the light and sounds of the upper world conflicted with the dimness and the dying hymn-tune of the under, Rachel felt a hand drop upon her shoulder. "'Miss Vinrace, Mrs. Flushing whispered peremptorily, "'stay to luncheon. It's such a dismal day they don't even give one beef for luncheon. Please stay. Here they came out into the hall, where once more the little band was greeted with curious respectful glances by the people who had not gone to church, although their clothing made it clear that they approved of Sunday to the very verge of going to church. Rachel felt unable to stand any more of this particular atmosphere and was about to say she must go back, when Terence passed them, drawn along in talk with Evelyn M. Rachel thereupon contented herself with saying that the people looked very respectable, which negative remark Mrs. Flushing interpreted to mean that she would stay. English people abroad, she returned with a vivid flash of malice, ain't they awful but we won't stay here she continued plucking at rachel's arm come up to my room she bore her past hewitt and evelyn and the thornburys and the elliots hewitt stepped forward luncheon he began miss vinrace has promised to lunch with me said mrs flushing and began to pound energetically up the staircase, as though the middle classes of England were in pursuit. She did not stop until she had slammed her bedroom door behind them. "'Well, what did you think of it?' she demanded, panting slightly. All the disgust and horror which Rachel had been accumulating burst forth beyond her control. I thought it the most loathsome exhibition I'd ever seen, she broke out. How can they? How dare they? What do they mean by it? Mr. Bax, hospital nurses, old men, prostitutes. Disgusting. She hit off the points she remembered as fast as she could, but she was too indignant to stop to analyze her feelings. Mrs. Flushing watched her with keen gusto as she stood ejaculating with emphatic movements of her head and hands in the middle of the room. "'Go on, go on, do go on,' she laughed. 
clapping her hands. It's delightful to hear you. But why do you go? Rachel demanded. I've been every Sunday of my life ever since I can remember, Mrs. Flushing chuckled, as though that were a reason by itself. Rachel turned abruptly to the window. She did not know what it was that had put her into such a passion. The sight of Terence in the hall had confused her thoughts, leaving her merely indignant. She looked straight at their own villa, halfway up the side of the mountain. The most familiar view seen framed through glass has a certain unfamiliar distinction, and she grew calm as she gazed. Then she remembered that she was in the presence of someone she did not know well, and she turned and looked at Mrs. Flushing. Mrs. Flushing was still sitting on the edge of the bed, looking up, with her lips parted, so that her strong white teeth showed in two rows. Tell me, she said, which do you like best, Mr. Hewitt or Mr. Hurst? Mr. Hewitt, Rachel replied, but her voice did not sound natural. Which is the one who reads Greek in church, Mrs. Flushing demanded. It might have been either of them, and while Mrs. Flushing proceeded to describe them both, and to say that both frightened her, but one frightened her more than the other. Rachel looked for a chair. The room, of course, was one of the largest and most luxurious in the hotel. There were a great many armchairs and settees covered in brown holland, but each of these was occupied by a large square piece of yellow cardboard, and all the pieces of cardboard were dotted or lined with spots or dashes of bright oil paint. But you're not to look at those, said Mrs. Flushing, as she saw Rachel's eye wander. She jumped up and turned as many as she could, face downwards, upon the floor. Rachel, however, managed to possess herself of one of them, and with the vanity of an artist, Mrs. Flushing demanded anxiously, Well? Well? It's a hill, Rachel replied. There could be no doubt that Mrs. Flushing had represented the vigorous and abrupt fling of the earth up into the air. You could almost see the clods flying as it whirled. Rachel passed from one to another. They were all marked by something of the jerk and decision of their maker. They were all perfectly untrained onslaughts of the brush upon some half-realized idea suggested by hill or tree, and they were all in some way characteristic of Mrs. Flushing. I see things movin', Mrs. Flushing explained. So, she swept her hand through a yard of the air. She then took up one of the cardboards which Rachel had laid aside, seated herself on a stool, and began to flourish a stump of charcoal, while she occupied herself in strokes which seemed to serve her as speech serves others. Rachel, who was very restless, looked about her. "'Open the wardrobe,' said Mrs. Flushing after a pause, speaking indistinctly because of a paintbrush in her mouth and look at the things. As Rachel hesitated, Mrs. Flushing came forward, still with a paintbrush in her mouth, flung open the wings of her wardrobe, and tossed a quantity of shawls, stuffs, cloaks, embroideries on to the bed. Rachel began to finger them. Mrs. Flushing came up once more, and dropped a quantity of beads, brooches, earrings, bracelets, tassels, and combs among the draperies. Then she went back to her stool and began to paint in silence. The stuffs were colored and dark and pale. They made a curious swarm of lines and colors upon the counterpane with the reddish lumps of stone and peacock's feathers and clear pale tortoise-shell combs lying among them. The women wore them hundreds of years ago. They wear em still, Mrs. Flushing remarked. My husband rides about and finds em. They don't know what they're worth, 
so we get em cheap. And we shall sell em to smart women in London, she chuckled, as though the thought of these ladies and their absurd appearance amused her. After painting for some minutes, she suddenly laid down her brush and fixed her eyes upon Rachel. I tell you what I want to do, she said. I want to go up there and see things for myself. It's silly staying here with a pack of old maids as though we were at the seaside in England. I want to go up the river and see the natives in their camps. It's only a matter of ten days under canvas. My husband's done it. One would lie out under the trees at night and be towed down the river by day. And if we saw anything nice, we'd shout out and tell em to stop. She rose and began piercing the bed again and again with a long golden pin, as she watched to see what effect her suggestion had upon Rachel. We must make up a party, she went on. Ten people could hire a launch. Now you'll come, and Mrs. Ambrose'll come, and will Mr. Hurst and t'other gentlemen come? Where's a pencil? She became more and more determined and excited as she evolved her plan. She sat on the edge of the bed and wrote down a list of surnames, which she invariably spelt wrong. Rachel was enthusiastic, for indeed the idea was immeasurably delightful to her. She had always had a great desire to see the river and the name of Terence threw a luster over the prospect, which made it almost too good to come true. She did what she could to help Mrs. Flushing by suggesting names, helping her to spell them, and counting up the days of the week upon her fingers. As Mrs. Flushing wanted to know all she could tell her about the birth and pursuits of every person she suggested, and threw in wild stories of her own as to the temperaments and habits of artists, and people of the same name who used to come to Chillingly in the old days, but were doubtless not the same, though they too were very clever men interested in Egyptology. The business took some time. At last Mrs. Flushing sought her diary for help, the method of reckoning dates on the fingers proving unsatisfactory. She opened and shut every drawer in her writing-table, and then cried furiously, Yarmouth! Yarmouth! Drat that woman! She's always out of the way when she's wanted. At this moment the luncheon gong began to work itself into its midday frenzy. Mrs. Flushing rang her bell violently. The door was opened by a handsome maid, who was almost as upright as her mistress. "'Oh, Yarmouth,' said Mrs. Flushing, "'just find my diary, and see where ten days from now would bring us to, and ask the hall-porter how many men it'd be wanted to row eight people up the river for a week, and what it'd cost, and put it on a slip of paper, and leave it on my dressing-table.' Now, she pointed at the door with a superb forefinger, so that Rachel had to lead the way. Oh, and Yarmouth, Mrs. Flushing called back over her shoulder, put those things away and hang em in their right places. There's a good girl, or it fusses Mr. Flushin. To all of which Yarmouth merely replied, Yes, ma'am. As they entered the long dining-room, it was obvious that the day was still Sunday, although the mood was slightly abating. The Flushing's table was set by the side in the window, so that Mrs. Flushing could scrutinize each figure as it entered, and her curiosity seemed to be intense. Old Mrs. Paley, she whispered, as the wheeled chair slowly made its way through the door, Arthur pushing behind. Thornbury's came next. That nice woman, she nudged Rachel to look at Miss Allen. What's her name? 
the painted lady who always came in late tripping into the room with a prepared smile as though she came out upon a stage might well have quailed before mrs flushing's stare which expressed her steely hostility to the whole tribe of painted ladies next came the two young men whom mrs flushing called collectively the hursts they sat down opposite across the gangway mr flushing treated his wife with a mixture of admiration and indulgence making up by the suavity and fluency of his speech for the abruptness of hers while she darted and ejaculated he gave rachel a sketch of the history of south american art he would deal with one of his wife's exclamations and then return as smoothly as ever to his theme he knew very well how to make a luncheon pass agreeably without being dull or intimate he had formed the opinion so he told rachel that wonderful treasures lay hid in the depths of the land the things rachel had seen were merely trifles picked up in the course of one short journey he thought there might be giant gods hewn out of stone in the mountainside and colossal figures standing by themselves in the middle of vast green pasture lands where none but natives had ever trod before the dawn of european art he believed that the primitive huntsmen and priests had built temples of massive stone slabs had formed out of the dark rocks and the great cedar trees majestic figures of gods and of beasts and symbols of the great forces water air and forest among which they lived there might be prehistoric towns like those in greece and asia standing in open places among the trees filled with the works of this early race nobody had been there scarcely anything was known thus talking and displaying the most picturesque of his theories rachel's attention was fixed upon him she did not see that hewitt kept looking at her across the gangway between the figures of waiters hurrying past with plates he was inattentive and hurst was finding him also very cross and disagreeable they had touched upon all the usual topics upon politics and literature gossip and christianity they had quarrelled over the service which was every bit as fine as sappho according to hewitt so that hurst's paganism was mere ostentation why go to church he demanded merely in order to read sappho hurst observed that he had listened to every word of the sermon as he could prove if hewitt would like a repetition of it and he went to church in order to realize the nature of his creator which he had done very vividly that morning thanks to mr bax who had inspired him to write three of the most superb lines in english literature an invocation to the deity i wrote em on the back of the envelope of my aunt's last letter he said and pulled it from between the pages of sappho well let's hear them said hewitt slightly mollified by the prospect of a literary discussion my dear hewitt do you wish us both to be flung out of the hotel by an enraged mob of thornburys and elliots hurst inquired the merest whisper would be sufficient to incriminate me forever god he broke out what's the use of attempting to write when the world's peopled by such damned fools seriously hewitt i advise you to give up literature what's the good of it there's your audience he nodded his head at the tables where a very miscellaneous collection of europeans were now engaged in eating in some cases in gnawing the stringy foreign fowls hewitt looked and grew more out of temper than ever hurst looked too his eyes fell upon rachel and he bowed to her 
I rather think Rachel's in love with me, he remarked, as his eyes returned to his plate. That's the worst of friendships with young women. They tend to fall in love with one. To that Hewitt made no answer whatever, and sat singularly still. Hurst did not seem to mind getting no answer, for he returned to Mr. Bax again, quoting the peroration about the drop of water, and when Hewitt scarcely replied to these remarks either, he merely pursed his lips, chose a fig, and relapsed quite contentedly into his own thoughts, of which he always had a very large supply. When luncheon was over, they separated, taking their cups of coffee to different parts of the hall. From his chair beneath the palm tree, Hewitt saw Rachel come out of the dining room with the flushings. He saw them look round for chairs and choose three in a corner where they could go on talking in private. Mr. Flushing was now in the full tide of his discourse. He produced a sheet of paper upon which he made drawings as he went on with his talk. He saw Rachel lean over and look, pointing to this and that with her finger. Hewitt unkindly compared Mr. Flushing who was extremely well-dressed for a hot climate, and rather elaborate in his manner, to a very persuasive shopkeeper. Meanwhile, as he sat looking at them, he was entangled in the Thornburys, and Miss Allen, who, after hovering about for a minute or two, settled in chairs round him, holding their cups in their hands, they wanted to know whether he could tell them anything about Mr. Bax. Mr. Thornbury, as usual, sat saying nothing, looking vaguely ahead of him, occasionally raising his eyeglasses, as if to put them on, but always thinking better of it at the last moment, and letting them fall again. After some discussion, the ladies put it beyond a doubt that Mr. Bax was not the son of Mr. William Bax. There was a pause. Then Mrs. Thornbury remarked that she was still in the habit of saying Queen instead of King in the National Anthem. There was another pause. Then Miss Allen observed reflectively that going to church abroad always made her feel as if she had been to a sailor's funeral. There was then a very long pause, which threatened to be final, when mercifully a bird about the size of a magpie, but of a metallic blue colour, appeared on the section of the terrace that could be seen from where they sat. Mrs. Thornbury was led to inquire whether we should like it if all our rooks were blue. What do you think, William? she asked, touching her husband on the knee. If all our rooks were blue, he said. He raised his glasses. He actually placed them on his nose. They would not live long in Wiltshire, he concluded. He dropped his glasses to his side again. The three elderly people now gazed meditatively at the bird, which was so obliging as to stay in the middle of the view for a considerable space of time, thus making it unnecessary for them to speak again. Hewitt began to wonder whether he might not cross over to the Flushing's corner when Hurst appeared from the background, slipped into a chair by Rachel's side, and began to talk to her with every appearance of familiarity. Hewitt could stand it no longer. He rose, took his hat, and dashed out of doors. End of chapter 17